Well, I'm not allowed to ask anymore because we're stopped. So, um, all right, we have a collection of things. Clearly, a lot of theory. Oh, theory, theory, theory. Scary stuff. You know, proofs. Big old stuff. Mathematics. Machine independent stuff. It's not that scary, so don't worry. Um, so, all of these things are true. We will cover a lot of this stuff. Um, if I had to point to anything of this that I would say is sort of the closest to describing overall what the class is about, I would say it's this last one. That we're going to be learning algorithms, we're going to be learning how to solve problems. You know, you, so all of you have mentioned very specific things mostly related to complexity and trying to understand things formally. But fundamentally, the study of algorithms is about solving problems. That's really all there is to it. <coughs> you know, yes, you learn all these formal techniques and you learn ways to prove stuff and you learn all these strange jargon about your, you know, writing a conqueror and this and that, that's fine. But fundamentally, you're just trying to learn how to solve problems. That's really all there is to it. And you've already learned how to solve problems in your other classes, in 2420, in a data structures class, in an algorithms, in an undergrad algorithms class, or somewhere else. You, you have been solving problems yourself. You've written any piece of code anywhere. You've been doing algorithms. You may not have actually set up and proved something about it, but you've been solving problems. And that's all we want to do here. Give you more, hopefully better, and more advanced tools to solve problems. And in addition, as an extra bonus, give you ways to sort of defend your the proof, the, the, the solution you have with a formal argument saying, yes, not only is it a good solution, actually I can prove to you that it works well. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to have, you want to be sure that what you're doing is correct. You want to be sure that what you're doing works fast. Right? Now works fast, of course, will often be in the context of something like bigger notation. And we'll talk a little bit about that and why that comes up and why that comes up and why we obsess so much about it. Um, but fundamentally, that's what this class is going to be about. We're going to be learning how to solve problems. We're going to be used to learning all kinds of nice tools. So if you think of your toolbox, with your screwdrivers and your wrenches and everything, if you start off with just one screwdriver, there are certain things you can do. And there are certain things you can try to do with a screwdriver, but they won't quite work. The whole point of this class is to give you a much richer toolbox with many, many more tools in it. And the way to recognize, ah, this problem requires a wrench. This problem requires a screwdriver. This problem requires a hex wrench. Or something like that. I'm not really but I did fix my garage door, so I'm all about the tools. Okay. Okay? So that's the big picture. And that's, that's okay. But more specifically, even more specifically, what kinds of things will we study in the class? Okay, quick question. How many of you have seen the syllabus that I posted on Canva? You know, I'm sad. I spent a good 10 minutes writing that syllabus in the class. Okay. Please go look at the syllabus on Canvas. In fact, please regularly look at Canvas. Everything I want to put will be there. Okay? Everything I want to communicate with you will be there. Right? And it'll be annoying for me to have to keep sending emails saying, oh, there's something new. Just go check. You know? Especially after a lecture, I'll be putting up notes, I'll be putting up things. It'll be all there. All in the main syllabus page and you know, I'll have announcements and stuff like that. So go look. So if you go to look at the syllabus on Canvas, you will, I will have a bit more detail about what kind of topics we'll be covering. And these are, first of all, basic tools, things that you have probably seen before. So you've, if you've taken any kind of undergraduate class in algorithms, you've seen, you've at least heard of or at least have some vague familiarity with things like recursion. Divide and conquer. And it's its friend decimation. You have heard of um, greedy algorithms. Everyone loves greedy algorithms. They like the Coke, they like the Coke or other preferred soft drink of your choosing of algorithms. Greedy algorithms. They're, everyone loves them and they're really bad for you in large quantities. Right? You've heard of this thing that you're supposed to learn in order to get an interview at Google. It's called dynamic programming or something. <laughs> <laughs> All you know is yes, if you, if you can do this properly, you'll crack one, at least one of the many rounds of interviews at Google. <laughs> then you have weed out classes in a course, right? You know, in a whole curriculum, you have weed out courses. This is a weed-out tool. If someone can't do this, that's an automatic sign is a problem. Um, and these all you've seen before. So what we're not, we're going to quickly review them, um, but with a bit of an extra kind of 
formal lens to them to try and understand at a deeper level, <coughs> then to recognize that a problem is amenable to one of these students, and when you might use it, how you might reason about why it works. Okay. Uh, we're also going to look at slightly more advanced techniques. Again, some of these, some of these you may have encountered, some of these you may not have. Um, flows, max flows, matchings. How many of you have heard of flows, matchings, cuts? A few. So good. So you'll see much more about this. And this is a very interesting tool because it's a kind of tool where many of these tools you could probably invent on your own if you're writing code without realizing it. And that's fairly natural. This is not as natural. It's not as obvious. It would be a little bit harder for you to invent this in your own. And therefore, if you have a problem which needs this tool, you may not actually know what to do with the problem. And if you don't know what to do with it, you'll end up with something that doesn't work at all. So flows are kind of a handy thing to have. But of course, you know, we live in the world of data, big data, data track, everything's all about the data, not about the algorithm, right? So if you're, if you're all about the data, what, you know, there, there are many, many more things you might want to care about. And of course, there are lots of classes that focus on data itself. But even within the realm of algorithms, there are lots of tools that are much more useful when you're dealing with big data, lots of data, high-speed data, this, that, whatever you want. And these tools that you probably have not seen before. And these are sort of the twin tools, the Laurel and Hardy, if you wish, or the other tweet fairy you would prefer. Um, randomization, randomness, and approximation. In other words, not giving the right answer and not even being sure that you've given the right answer. So it's like ways in which you can sort of not give the correct answer, but in a provable way. Right? I'm really, really sure that my answer is only 10% away from the best answer. This is sort of to be surprisingly useful, not just because for some problems you have no choice. You have <laughs> to give a kind of hazy answer. And so if you have to give a hazy answer, you might actually like to say, look, it's hazy, but it's not that bad. I can give you some kind of guarantees on what it is. And also randomness helps because randomness basically means you're allowed to toss coins in your algorithm. You know, we're about two hours away from Wendover here. So we're going to go all the way to Wendover, at least in our minds, and um, toss coins to win. And, but in this case, we'll actually win. Wendover, you never win. No, no, no. So, okay? So we'll cover all those things. We'll also cover just because I'm mean and I'm like that. We'll cover some complexity theory, some NP hardness, right? Because, you know, if you bang your head against a problem for way longer than you should, it'd be nice if someone would say, look, don't worry. There are like five gazillion other smart people who also bang their head against them. They're not gonna get me right, so just chill. And that's, that's basically the summary of NP hardness. It's the, uh, it's, the, it's the social network of algorithms. I can't solve it, but no one, none of my friends can either. And more, more importantly, it, it, it captures an idea that's very surprising if you've never seen it before. The idea that you can take a description of a problem and just by looking at that description of the problem say, aha, this is really hard to solve without knowing anything else about it. That's a very bizarre notion that merely writing down the description of a question can tell you whether it's easy to solve or not. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at how you're going to do that. It's almost magic. And then, of course, with all of these things, there's, there will be a time, this will not cover the entire course, there will be time for special topics. We will definitely cover something which you may have heard of called linear programming. Uh, this is the, your gateway drug into all kinds of optimization, which if you do anything with data, you'll end up doing. Uh, we'll other cover, probably cover other topics as well, depending on time, maybe it's a bit of uh, what I call streaming algorithms, things that work well, really well, with small amounts of memory on large data, or things that work while looking at small portions of the data. So surprisingly, if you have lots of data that you want to process, it's possible to look at only small bits of it and still come up with a good answer for what's going on in the data. It's possible to look at all the data in one shot, but not remember anything you've seen. In a niche, you can still say good things about the data. This whole idea of sublinearity, doing things in sublinear time, sublinear space, or with sublinear resources of some kind, <coughs> is something that's a big issue right now. And we'll hopefully talk a bit about that once we've built up some muscles in our, in our tools. And you know, some of these things will overlap. You can get some taste of sublinearity with the data mining class. You might get coverage of randomness approximation in data mining or in uh, the theory of machine learning class and so on. So the, one of the things that is actually a feature or a bug 
is that you might see this material in a couple of different places when you, when you, when you go through your program. Okay? And the thing that we focus on this class, of course, and some of you have alluded to this already, the thing that we focus on is the idea of proofs, right? the idea of being formal. And the reason we do that is for many reasons. One is that you actually can, if you can say something precise about the behavior of an algorithm, why not? Right? That's just great. It's an extra, extra bonus if you can do that. And sometimes thinking formally about how to prove that an algorithm works the way you expect it to tells you ways in which it's not being designed correctly. The fact that you can't say anything formally about how correct it is means there's something wrong. So it's almost a diagnostic tool. And conversely, knowing how to prove that an algorithm is correct might actually also tell you how to design the algorithm in the first place. So there's a very complex synergy between designing and proving in a way that one doesn't necessarily come before the other all the time. Sometimes the proof comes first and the algorithm comes later. Sometimes the algorithm comes first and the proof comes later. And that's where things get kind of interesting. Okay. So we'll look at proofs of correctness. We'll look at proofs of performance. And performance doesn't just mean time. It doesn't just mean space. It could mean network latency. It could mean uh, number of database accesses. It could be any kind of resource. In fact, one of the things that you may not realize about the study of algorithm design is that the resources we measure to measure how good our algorithm is can change. It used to be just time. It occasionally used to be space. Sometimes it's how many random bits do you use, because that's an expensive resource. Getting truly random bits is kind of a hard thing to do. Sometimes it's how much communication are you doing. So you have two distributed nodes that are talking to each other, and they can do what they want locally. They've got a hugely powerful system. Yeah. Uh, but, but talking to each other is slow, relatively. And so how long does it take for them to talk to each other? Can you do things with a minimum amount of communication? And that's your resource, and that's what you're analyzing. So all these tools, divide and conquer, decimation, greedy, data programming, flows, randomness, approximation, all of these apply even for those kinds of questions. Any question where you have a resource and you want to optimize the resource is where these things come into play. It's not just run time. Okay. And hopefully, towards the end, we'll be able to sort of show some examples of how you might think about more general problems. So in other words, what we're getting in this course is a, is a rich mathematical framework for reasoning about computation in general. Right? Reasoning about the complexity of computation, complexity broadly defined. Reasoning about the correctness of the computation. Correctness broadly defined. And that's what you, what you will get. So this is how it's different, say, from you know, an undergrad album class. So you're just beginning to get used to these ideas. Here we're going to go deeper and deeper into so when you come out of this class, you will be not just a user of the tools, you'll be hopefully more proficient in these tools. And you may not actually remember any of the stuff. I will be very happy if you remember some of these things. But even if you don't, hopefully you have some tools at your disposal. And the next time you see a problem, you'll say, okay, I have these tools, let me, let me go back and flip through my notes and apply on them, and maybe something will come up. And that'll make me very happy. And someone comes back and says six months later, oh yeah, I actually tried that one little thing you mentioned in lecture three, which you said was boring, and it worked out. Uh, uh, and people have come back and told me. Okay? All right. Any questions? No? All good so far? All right. So then, well, let's start with it. So, we're going to start, of course, with the most sort of quintessentially computer science notion, the most basic notion, the thing that in some sense defines the field of computer science, recursion. Specifically, we're going to look at recursion in the context of algorithm design. I doubt at this point there's any of you in this room who does not know and use and understands at some level what recursion is. I'll just say it. recursion is the idea that it's, it's, a, it's the fundamentally computer science way of being lazy. Says, if I want to solve a problem, I will just do something quick to it and outsource it to the problem again. And as long as I can do that outsourcing, I don't care what happens. Somehow, someone, something happened. It got sent over the Atlantic somewhere. somewhere. It got solved somehow when I got it back. And that's all. If I can do that, I don't have to worry about what happens next. Because that's going to happen again and again and again and again and again. 
and some miraculous came across and did so. So when I have a way of thinking about a problem recursively, I'm not actually trying to solve the problem. All I'm trying to do is do some pattern matching. To take a problem, do something to it, so that I can invoke the same problem on smaller, different copies of that problem. And if I can do that, I'm done. The uh, recursion fairy in the notes of the view will come and sort of wave a magic wand and then boom, everything will get started. It's a beautiful idea. It's a, it's a really profound idea. And again, we're all you know, too old and too jaded to appreciate how beautiful it is. But it is a beautiful idea, first time you see it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this well-known idea that you're all very familiar with. We're going to take a problem that you're all very familiar with. And we're going to apply the well-known idea to the well-known problem and hopefully still understand something deeper. And so the well-known problem that we're going to apply the well-known idea to is one. And again, I fully you know, understand that all of you have seen sorting algorithms and know all of you need to know what. The point is not that. The point is to understand in a very structured, easy context how to think in this dividing model. So, so you want to sort a bunch of numbers. So you have numbers 1 through n, a1 through a n. And one of my one of my bad habits, as you will learn, since you're stuck in this at least for a week, um, is that I, I don't like writing pseudocode, writing very detailed pseudocode. So I'm going to describe a rough course about it. There'll be, I'm sure if I, if I had to go for a Google interview, I'll fail in the first 10 minutes, because my pseudocode would have bugs in it. And I'm sure you'll find the bugs. If you're merciful enough, don't point them out, because that's not, that's not my goal. <laughs> okay. So we want to sort a bunch of numbers, and we would like to do this recursively. In other words, all we want to do is do something so that we can call our magical sorting routine again. We don't want to do actual sorting. That's just too much work. Who wants to sort? Okay. And so if we look at a particular recursive strategy, the one that we call merge sort, so you see this before. Merge sort looks something like this. It says, well, I want to sort a bunch of things. Let me just break it up into pieces. So I have my numbers A1 through AN. I break it up somehow. I don't care how. And I sort each piece. So now this is all sorted. So this piece is sorted, this piece is sorted. Okay, well, that's fine, but I don't have a fully sorted list. Like, okay, fine, I have to do some work, okay, I'll do a little bit. What can I do with things that are only sorted? Well, that seems like a lot easier thing to do. If I have two things that are only sorted, maybe I can, now I can, you know, you know, just get up slowly, drink my coffee and think, okay, fine, this is sorted, that's sorted. If I have two sorted lists, so this is the first sorted list, let's call, it, let's call it A, the second sorted list, call it B. There is this merge procedure that again you see that says, you can think of a pointer at the first position A, think of the pointer at the first position in B, check which of the two is smaller, let's say you're sorting in ascending order. If whichever one is smaller, spit that one out first as your first answer and move that pointer. And again, compare the two pointers, check which one is smaller, move that pointer. Keep doing this till one pointer is at the end, and then just read off all the rest of the other pointers. Okay, so you see why I don't like super coding. What I just said is nice and easy. Of course, if you write it out, there's be more detail. And that's why we have notes for that. So the merge sort algorithm, which again, we've all seen, is not particularly surprising, is, is, um, is these two steps here. Again, how are, how are you all doing with the board here? Are you feeling? Deprived and discriminated against because I'm not using that board, or you feel like you're feeling it Would you be happy if I come in and wrote here? Would that make you feel that would that be easier if I were right here? Because I want to move here, and most of going to yell at me because he has to move the camera. Okay, 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 he's fine. Um, so the word sort of thing, the recursive procedure for more sort. Sorry, you got your chance. So consists of two parts, right? You have the divide step which is the recursive step usually, where you divide things up and solve the problem. And then you have the conquer step, 
where you put things back together. And this is the essence of the most basic tool in the algorithmic in the algorithm story kit, divide and conquer. Right? So the divide and conquer idea, the tool, is to take a problem, break it into pieces, solve the pieces, and put them back together. And for almost any problem, you could do this. In fact, trivially, if you took a problem, divided it into all tiny pieces of size one, and then put them back together, you it's actually the same problem. <laughs> right? If I say, okay, my sorting procedure is going to break my input into n pieces, sort the individual pieces of size one, which is, and then put them back together using sorting. It is a sorting procedure because you haven't actually done it. Right? Your recursion is not working for you. But why is your recursion not working for you in that case? Because you're actually asking yourself to solve a problem of the same size. You haven't actually done it. The hope in this dividing conquer is that you're asking yourself to solve a smaller problem, and then a smaller problem, and then a smaller problem, so that eventually you get down to a problem that actually is really easy to solve. So you take your, again, in this very simple case of merge sort, you have your input of size n, you're going to solve two problems of size n over 2, or something else. Actually, I didn't even say what I should solve. Let's say k and n minus k, right? I'm, I'm on, I don't know what I'm going to do. So I have k and n minus k, and then again and again and again. Eventually, these will get down to single size problems, which are easy to solve, and then your recursion rolls back up. Right? So, and this is where the whole interaction between proof and algorithm comes in. The algorithmic strategy of divide and conquer is only effective if you split and merge in ways that are effective. It's not, if, your, if your conquer strategy is very expensive, then maybe this is not going to help you. If your split strategy is kind of not doing anything useful, maybe it's not going to help you. So the thing that makes divide and conquer actually work as a useful tool for algorithms is in the details of how you do the split and how you do the merge. Right? Okay? Hold that thought. In fact, hold that thought for about three minutes. We'll take a little break. I find it's hard to concentrate for this long. Plus, if you want to get some water, you want to go take a break for me. We'll be back in about three minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
that's the frustrating thing. I think we have to go out. I didn't think it was going to go Try to reduce the problem size in some way. 
so that you can do something. And then once you've reduced the problem size, you've got some answers. Maybe you've asked a couple of questions to your, to your recursive oracle. You can somehow combine the answers and stuff. And whether this is going to be correct or not, whether this is going to be effective or not, are some things you have to figure out. And that's what the formal part of the solution is. But the idea is very clear. Just do it because. So how do we reason that such a thing is correct? And it turns out for these kinds of recursive algorithms, they're very easy way to check if something is correct. If you have a recursive algorithm, you need a recursive proof. And the most elementary recursive proof we've seen is a proof by induction. Because what does a proof by induction say? Proof by induction says, well, you know, let's we want to prove it's true for all n. Let's assume it's true for all n prime less than n. That's my recursive step. Assuming that it's true for all n prime less than n, let me try to now show that it's true for n. This is the conquer step. Induction is a dividing conquer algorithm in this guys. In other words, Look at the standard proof. So proof. So a standard proof by induction, or a standard statement that you want to prove by induction. There's some statement you want to prove, and it has a parameter associated with it. So prove that p of n is true. Prove that the algorithm for merge sort is correctly sorts a list of n numbers. So that's my p of n. So let's say that this is merge sort correctly sorts all lists of n numbers. This is the statement whose truth you want to verify. And the parameter there is an n. So the induction proof says, well, we have two things, right? So like any recursive strategy, you need a base case and you need the recursion, right? So the induction base case is what? Is it true for, for one? If you have one element, well, of course, it sorts. That may not be very interesting. What about for two? Is it true for two? Sometimes the base case is you need to choose the right base case, otherwise it doesn't help you with what you want to prove. So base case of two says I have two elements. I split them up, trivially sort them, and I, I compare them now. These are my two lists. I output the one that's smaller. Well, this is correct. It's going to be the right answer. So we've established that P2 is true. This is my recursion base case, or my inductive base case. Then my inductive hypothesis says, assume p n minus 1 true. And you will find that sometimes you assume p n prime true for all n prime less than n. In fact, we'll assume that version here. So assume p n prime true for all n prime less than n. Okay. It's a strong induction hypothesis. And once you have that, the goal is to then prove, given this and this, prove this. Given your recursion and your base case, design the algorithm. So the, the proof structure, that the algorithm map very nicely to each other. So in this case, what did you say? Well, we've assumed that the merge sort algorithm by the induction hypothesis correctly sorted these two sets. So all that's left to do, famous last words, is to check that the merge procedure is doing the right thing. And if you look at the notes, there's a bunch of cases you have to look at. Say, okay, in which case it was, you know, how it's moving the pointers, and other cases correct. They're all local cases. You verify them one by one. Once you have that proof, you've now shown that inductive hypothesis plus base case implies um, P of N. Well, this is true, this is true. This is, so since P2 is true, you can now prove P3. Since P3 is true, you can now prove P4. And then the dominoes all fall. So the proof of correctness for a dividing conquer strategy is just that induction. If you want to verify it's correct, make sure that your inductive step, the merging step essentially, the conquering step is correct. And once you've done that, you're done. For the most part. 
So sometimes there are a little variation. For the most part, that's going to work. So that's the proof of correctness. But that's fine. Okay, fine. We weren't seriously, maybe we weren't seriously doubting this would be a correct algorithm. But the real question is, is it a good algorithm? Is it effective? And this context, effectiveness means, does it run fast? Does it run better than what you could do if you used Bobosort or something? Have you heard of Bobosort? No? Can you, one of you tell me what Bobosort is? Uh, you take the array, you permute it, and you check to see if it's sorted. It's a great algorithm. It's a good idea. If it's not sorted, what do you do? Uh, you permute you it again. Permute it. Just keep permuting it until you get a sorted answer. It only takes n factorial time. Hey, of course. <laughs> so if you want to do sort, that's our, that's our baseline. Can we do better than Bobo sort? And, and the only parameter we've not specified here is how we do this split. Right? So how do we how do we even think about trying to exp solve the running time problem for this, for how to estimate the running time of this strategy? Well, again, it has to be recursive. So let's say the running time is described by some function, t of n, right? Then all we can do now is express t of n recursively in terms of itself. And one way to think about that is, no, the way it works is t of n is comprised of, well, one merge step on k things, one sorting step on k things, one sorting step on, oh, sorry, k things and n minus k things, and then a merging procedure to zip them up, which, if you think about it, will take linear time. Time linear in the size of the total of the two lists. Because at every step, one of these pointers moves forward. So at every step, one of the elements gets consumed. There are a total of n elements, so in n steps, all the elements have now been consumed. So, and the dreaded constant rears and suddenly it. And you get something like this, a recursive expression of the running time of the algorithm. So what do you do with this now? This is not that easy to deal with either. It's not particularly easy to solve. And that's where, we have another tool, a tool that again you may have seen before. How many of you have heard of something called a master theorem? Master. master theorem? Okay, put your hand up high, way high. How many of you can state the master theorem? <laughs> <laughs> so you've heard of it, but you forgot it. <laughs> I was going to ask how many of you can prove it within the hands of your pen. <laughs> so it turns out, luckily enough for us, that there is another tool we can use that we can take and go. Here, running time, stamp, go, done. And that's really nice. Because what that tool does, right, it's, it doesn't just give us a way to analyze the algorithm. You stare at the tool long enough, you stare at it long enough, and it tells you how to design an algorithm as well. It's really cool. Okay? So it's not just a way to analyze, it's a way to tell you how to design. So, Let's, let's stop for a second. Let's do the same thing for binary search. Again, for binary search, if you want to think about the correctness of the procedure, what you're saying is that, assume that if x was in my subpiece, I would have found it. Was the way in which I decided to go look at that subpiece correct or not? And so your proof says, well, in the base case, I have one element, either I see it or I don't, it's correct. In the general case, assume it works for all small subsets. Now what I'm doing is I'm going and looking at some of them and saying, okay, am I more, less than, or equal to that element? Since my array is sorted, I know that if my query is less than that element, I have to go to the, the lower side. And I know from the induction hypothesis that I will correctly get the answer here, so my overall strategy is correct. If I have to go to the higher side, again, it's a smaller set, and I know that my induction hypothesis guarantees I'll get the correct answer, so I'm overall correct. If it's the same thing, I love it. In all three cases, my induction hypothesis combined with what I'm doing guarantees me correctness and I'm done. But again, in binary search, the next question would be how do you get a running time argument? And again, there you could say, well, the query time is the time it takes to answer the question in a list of size n. Right? And this consists of a single operation compared to one element in the middle, 
to 1, or a constant, plus a recursive step on something of a smaller size. Okay? So just like I got here, I got an expression for the running time in terms of the same function with smaller values attached to it. Here again, I have an expression for the query time in terms of the same function taking a smaller value of this parameter. Yes? What, when really trying to analyze these algorithms, though, wouldn't it be important to know what, I guess, what parameters are really being needed in, in this algorithm? Uh, yeah. You know, for merge sorter, as an example, with memories being allocated um, yeah. as part of that analysis, yeah. uh, because that would make a huge difference. Ah, so the question, so the, the, the game in algorithm design always is, Tell me what you want to analyze first, and then I will analyze it for you. If you shift the goalpost on me, we're going to start again and do the analysis. My single analysis I did for your first question is not going to handle the sort of product drift as you sort of ask other questions. You're going to have to redo the analysis again. If, for example, you're worried about merge sort, right? you could say, what is the space requirement for merge sort? Right? And even that I can express recursively. I can say, the space requirement of merge sort to sort n items, right? if I implement the algorithm in a particular way saying I sort this, I sort that, will consist of the space requirement to sort this, and the space requirement to sort that, if I'm not reusing space, plus the space to store the merge sets, should be this. So you'll get this. So once we have a tool that can analyze these kinds of expressions, we can analyze space, we can analyze time, we can analyze disk access, we can do whatever we want. But we have to decide up front what is the quantity we're trying to analyze? And that's why I said time is not the only issue here. Think of this as a generic tool for any kind of analysis. Any kind of device. Yeah? Okay, good. Good question. All right. So it's, it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that any time you have a divide and conquer strategy, you're going to get something that looks like this. Because it's recursive by nature, your expression for your running time is going to express itself in terms of itself for smaller values, if you've done this right. So we already have a hammer to do correctness proofs, the induction argument. So we need a hammer for the bounds, and that's going to be the mouse. So like most things, the fact that you can't actually remember the master, I don't mind at all. Because memorizing these things is not really useful. What I would like you to learn is how to derive it from scratch yourself if you need to. Because that's more important. It's more important to know where the theorem comes from than to just sort of memorize a bunch of symbols and say, okay, I hope I can remember these symbols later. Okay. So that's where, that's where all the botanists start, and we're going to get a deeper understanding of it. So the idea of the Mars theorem is, is, as it turns out, a succinct way to capture the behavior of such functions that are defined in curve. And to understand where the theorem comes from, it's helpful to understand what these things actually look like. And as always, you'll see, what, what will be interesting to look at is to think, a good way to think about this is in the form of a tree. So let's think of our merge sort records. So we said, so these are called, I should have said this, these types of things are called recurrence relations. And I will hand out a very beautiful uh, note, lecture notes, on how to solve different kinds of recurrence relations that I strongly encourage you to look at, because it's just a lot of fun. And it really explains how these things work. A recurrence relation, like the more sort of recurrence relation, think of it as having a root node here. Right. In fact, think of this as saying, I have, I'm doing something with n items. Right. And the way I do that something with n items is, I do something with n over 2 items, or n over n minus k, so I'm giving the answer at that time, n minus k. And I have some extra stuff I'm doing, which is not recursive. Right. And so these will again break down, these will break down, this will, just, this will not break down at all, and I'll get more things done. There are two processes at play here that are fighting each other. 
One process is the process by which subproblems are being produced. Every time you do recursion, you're producing subproblems. Right? The more recursion you do, the more subproblems you produce. That's one process. That's the expansive growth process. Then there's the collector who comes along and tries to organize that mess. That's the conquer process. Which comes like, okay, fine, you just create all these substances, you litter the model of the table, and I will go clean now. Takes me some to go clean. So there's, in some sense, a competition between these two. How long it takes to clean things up, how long it takes to produce new things, or how many new things get produced. If it takes a long time to clean things up, then this process will dominate. If you start producing many, 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 many things, this process will dominate. And the balance between those two processes is what leads to different results for different kinds of problems. Okay? So think of it as kind of a fight between the recursive step and the merging step. Who's going to win? On that note, Think of a very generic reference form, right? where you take something and you divide it into pieces. We'll start with a very simple version of this, where we always divide it into pieces of the same size. Okay. So for example, I have some reference here. I divide it into pieces of size n over b. So what would be simply of size n over 2? or number three or number four, some integer. And I have a whole bunch of them. I may have B of them, or I may not. I may have more, I may have less. So in general, I have some A of them. Okay. If A is less than, so if B is two and A is one, or B is four and A is three, it's almost as if you're breaking them to pieces, but you're not looking at all the pieces. If A is more than B, it's almost like you're looking at pieces over and over again. Because they're all that. All these things can happen. And then, in addition to all those pieces I'm breaking myself up to do recursion, there's some kind of merge conquer step, which takes some other time, which is, let's say, G. This is what my recursive procedure looks like. And if you think about it, if I set, you know, k to be n over 2, and set this to be whatever, n over something, I will get a reference of the form that, is, that fits in this framework. Okay. And so we can write out this reference. We can say this looks like t of n is equal to a times, there are a copies of running the, record, of running the recursion on a set of size n over b, plus This is my thing that I want to solve. Okay? All right. Now, what's going to happen here? So let's start writing this out. So remember the A of these things. Now this will go down to the next level. This will be something like there'll be pieces of size n over b squared. There'll be a whole bunch of them. Each of these A pieces of size n over b will break into A more pieces of size n over b squared. So I'll have a square of these things, right? And then I will also have to merge them up, right? So there are A such blobs. So I will spend A times G of n over b, right? Because I'm going to do that merge step for each of these blobs here. And then this will again go down to I have n over b cubed. I have a cubed of these. And this will be a squared times g of n over b squared. Right? We keep going all the way to the bottom. I will keep doing this till these numbers become really small, like a constant or one or two or whatever. At that point, I assume it takes me constant time to solve. So I keep going down till these become a constant, and I, then I solve them. Okay? So if I had to tally up all the work I'm doing here, 
all the work I'm doing this process. What is the work I'm doing? Well, and one part of the work I'm doing is the merge work. So I'm spending g of n plus a times g of n over b plus a squared times g of n over b squared plus, and we'll have to figure out what comes at the end there. We also have the number of pieces down here. Okay, so first of all, how many levels down do we have to go? How long will we go till what we have here, n over b to the something, is a constant? So, in other words, what is the value? So this is 1, 2, 3. Find k such that n over b to the k is the stage 2. What is k going to be? Then? Wow. Let's take it 1, just make it even small. What's it going to be? Assume things divide through and blah, blah, blah. We'll just pretend, you know, we'll ignore those issues for now. What, what divides what? So, what is value k? Anyone? Okay. okay. So then, how many pieces will you have here? Well, at the first level, we had a pieces. At the second level, we had a squared pieces. The third level, we had a cube pieces. So at the kth level, we'll have a to the k pieces. Oh, what's k? Well, that's k. Right? So number of pieces is equal to a to the log b base n. And I don't know if you know this cool trick. This is equal to 2 to the log a, right? Um, log n divided by log b. That's what log n base b is, right? Which is equal to, I'm getting low up here, so let me um, So this becomes 2 to the log n times log a divided by log b. I just vary these multiplications, which is equal to n to the log a base b. Okay. Just a more convenient expression for this. So remember we said we were fighting. We are having this fight between the number of pieces we are generating, which we now we know how much it is, and the amount of merge we were doing, which we know how much this is. Right? So this is going to go basically like, so the merge step, so this is the number of pieces, the merge step is going to be g of n plus a g n over b, all the way down to n to the log b base b of a, because that's a to the k, uh, g of 1. So these two pieces are fighting. And it turns out that depending on which is more powerful or which is more expensive, this or that, you get two different answers. Um, and the key is to think about it this way. So this expression is kind of hard to understand. Like what do I do with this? this I don't know what g is, it's kind of weird. This is where your best friend in the world is the geometric series. How many of you know the geometric series? I've seen one before. Okay. The geometric series is a, is a, is a summation of the form, or a set of the form, you know, uh, let's see, what's the best way to write? So it's a question, who said this? A, um, a, a times r, a times r squared, a times r cubed. Something where things are, there's a, there's a constant term and there's a multiplicative term that keeps going. Right? And you're often being asked to do things like sum of 
A R to the I, I is equal to zero. Okay? This is the geometric series. And the arithmetic series is where things increase arithmetically. So you might have A, A plus R, A plus 2R, A plus 3R, and so on. Right? As an arithmetic series. So this is a geometric series. The cool thing about a geometric series is that there are really only two possible answers for what the sum looks like. Either R is more than 1, in which case these numbers are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and only a last number really matters. Everything else doesn't really matter. Or R is less than 1, in which case these numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and only the first number matters, not the rest. So let's take a simple example of that. <coughs> So, suppose your series was 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth. So, A, A times R, A times R squared, where A is equal to 1 and R is equal to half. Right? You've probably seen this kind of summation before. You know the sums to? The sums to 2. If you let us go all the way to infinity, it'll sum to 2. So, the sum of this expression. Sigma a r to the i, i going from 0 to infinity, right, is basically a divided by 1 minus r. You can verify this. If r is, if r is um, less than 1, if r is more than 1, you can't sum it. But in this case, this will be basically 1 over half, which is root 2. So it's, it's off from the first number by a factor that depends only on the then the fact that you have all this sum doesn't matter. Only the first sum really controls this one. Okay? Conversely, if you have a series of the form 1, 2, 4, 8, right? Where a is equal to 1 and r is equal to 2. Now, of course, I don't have a sum to infinity, but I can say what is the sum up to n? Anyone have seen this before? No, this is. Plus one minus one. Well, in general. Oh. Yeah, we are right for that case. Yeah, it's uh, two to the or r to the n plus one, uh, coin d minus one. Yeah, so look at this. I think it's what you were saying. I didn't get to this. No, but basically, you, you got the you got the big yeah. So in other words, here, what's happening is that the thing that controls the outcome is the number of terms and r. A is just a scale of that. So the geometric series, if r is less than 1, only the first term matters. If r is more than 1, only the last term matters. Because what's the last term here? It's a r to the n, which is basically what's going to control this. Right, so this number is roughly a r to the n. Why? Because this is r to n plus 1, this is r, and we get it. So the geometric series, one of two things happens. Either the last term dominates or the first term dominates, depending on the scale. So now let's look at this. Okay? This is going to decide the, the, the conclusion of this war for us, at least for the Marshall theory. Suppose A times G of N over B is less than some constant times G of N. Okay? Where C is less than 1. You can do this as long as 1 is 2. Okay? So there's some constant strictly less than 1, so that a, g, n over b is less than or equal to that, to g of n. Okay? In other words, suppose that doing things with n, the merge step with n, is a lot more expensive than doing 
A merge steps with N over B. This merge step is way more expensive than this. Up by this constant factor. If you now look at this expression, this whole expression is less than this plus C times GN. So I just wrote that up. And then you can apply this again to the C squared GN, C cubed GN, C to the fourth GN, and so on. What you get is a geometric series where C, your R, is less than 1. Okay? And then it turns out only the first term matters. Okay? The second term doesn't matter. And T of n is equal to some constant times T. So what this is saying is very bizarre. What this is saying is that if the merge process is expensive, in the sense of it's way better to do the merge, it's, it's, more, it's more expensive to do the merge than to do the merge at split levels. Right? Um, then the running time is controlled by the merge. In other words, this is dominating all the expression. Conversely, if it's not the case, if in fact this some other constant, right? Where now this is more than that. Now if we go look at this expression, this last term is what's going to dominate. Because now C is more than 1. This is going to be more than this plus C times this plus C is more than 1. This is going to be much. And then the running time, T of n, is going to be controlled by the recursion. So if the merging process is expensive, that's what's going to control the running time. If the recursion is taking more work, that's what's going to control the running time. I will tell you what happens when we're equal to the running time. We'll talk about next time. Alright, that's it. We'll, we'll continue with this next on Thursday. Um, I hope I will see you all there.